of things, an insoluble problem for the Israelis. And the outcome is combustion explosion and a more radicalized element than perhaps anyone ever anticipated would emerge, particularly since it's turned out to be quite competent. And how do you judge now, the um the military and the political reaction of, of Benjamin Netanyahu? I've heard you saying in another interview, that our Prime Minister Netanyahu is in a way embarking on a mission of self-destruct with his way of addressing this problem with this war, now against Gaza, could you elaborate on that? How do you interpret, how do you judge the reaction of the Israeli in this moment? Do they have a plan? Do they know what they're doing? What's your impression? Well, the plan is to level as much of Gaza as possible, and then go in and root out the enemy. Of course, the problem is, who's the enemy? And that's where you run into the difficulty of separating so-called non-combatants from combatants. And that's not going to happen. People that are staying there now who are not members of Hamas, who are not fighters, are going to end up being killed. And I think there's something else happening with Netanyahu, who sees the criticality of revenge and leading this, this revenge campaign. He also has enormous power and influence in Washington, probably greater than ever in the history of Israel. And remember, Israel is another small state. Small states, when they're allied with large states, are always permanently interested in leveraging the power of the larger state in their behalf. Well, we have virtual control over events in Washington now, and Mr. Netanyahu can, can ask God politely and get pretty much whatever he wants without question. The Congress is in his pocket, if you will. So, America right now is prepared to do almost anything unconditionally for Israel. So, I think his attitude is, I'll leverage this, leverage our own power, and we'll annihilate our enemies. Well, the problem is that if the enemy were only in Gaza, that would be doable, probably even though it would be bloody and nasty. Uh, but you've got Hezbollah, and then you have the rest of the Muslim world in the Middle East, the Arab Middle East. You have Egypt, for instance, that fears a war. Egyptians don't want a war. Neither does Jordan. Both of those states are very fragile. They're trying to hold difficult societies together, but they stand a very high probability of being dragged in. And then, of course, you have Syria, which is, is already split between spheres of influence us Russian, Turkish, Iranian. Ah, and then you have the Turks and the Iranians, as well as the Peninsular Arabs. They are all uniting now in their antipathy for Israel and their determination to punish it. That's the problem. And so there's not enough military power that we can apply on behalf of Israel to compensate for that danger. Although I don't think Mr. Netanyahu believes that. And again, this is another failure. People tend to look at the Arab world as unchanged from 1973, 50 years ago. What happened? See, we triumphed. We, we were at a disadvantage. We came back and won the Arab world. Today is very different. These societies are more coherent, more cohesive. New technologies have emerged, which confer far greater capability on them than they formerly had. And then, of course, you have the Turks and the Iranians, and both of those states are very powerful in their own, right? The Turks, of course, have the largest army in NATO large air forces, and the Turks have a long martial history. They're ferocious fighters. There's a lot of bitterness and antipathy for Israel, in Turkey based on the killing of Turkish youth soldiers and civilians who tried to go in and provide Gaza with aid in the past. And on top of that, of course, the Iranian problem and the Israelis have sort of obsessed over Iran for years, utterly refusing any opportunity to talk or discuss anything. So here we are, we're now facing an insoluble problem. The entire region is united in its hatred, antipathy for Israel, and its determined determination that if Israel does not halt its war of annihilation on Gaza, that they will all engage, that may not happen all at once, but eventually it will. And behind the curtain, of course, the Russians have accommodated Israel repeatedly in Syria and in the Middle East, they've had good relations, and the Israelis turned on Russia and supported Ukraine sending Mossad over there, along with a lot of other equipment and aids intelligence ammunition. So Russia stands there and says, why should I help Israel? And of course, they have no reason to cooperate with us. So I would expect that at some point, Russia could easily be drawn into this as well. 
But again, it will not come in early, but it will come in at some point, particularly if we begin to fight with the Turks and the Iranians. Iran, especially Iran, is effectively an ally of Russia. This is a terrible set of circumstances, and the analogy that I've used repeatedly, as I said, go back to 1914, and here's the British government that has never gone to war against a German-speaking country. It's had nothing but good relations with German-speaking people, and all of a sudden, it makes a decision to intervene in the war on behalf of its age-old enemy France. If Britain had stayed out of the 1914 debacle, it would have simply been another European war. But when Britain entered it, it became a world war because as Bismarck had warned years earlier, eventually we would be drawn in to rescue Britain, which is exactly what happened. So the point is, once we get into this as a co-belligerent, I would argue we are effectively already won the potential for this war to rapidly widen and spread. Is that much greater? What a dangerous situation before we talk about this showdown scenario of a possible World War III. I think we have to confront this option. Of course, in this very difficult situation, just a quick question on, on Hamas. The last question on Hamas, I mean, I think it's undisputed that, and the people also understand that you have to fight against this enemy. Israel has said we want to destroy Hamas. You want to destroy Hamas. It sounds absolutely reasonable. Okay. They want to destroy Hamas. Now, the question is, how do you do that? I mean, we see in Gaza that they obviously have used millions and billions of aid money to construct a very sophisticated tunnel system, which is even more sophisticated than what the Americans have witnessed in Vietnam, or what the Americans have witnessed in Ibohemo in these terrible terrible island wars in the Pacific. I mean, how is it conceivable to um to f field this promise to Hamas to destroy Hamas? Is it possible to destroy Hamas? What would you say if you were the field commander, if you were the chief commander of the Israeli army, what would you say to, ah, to D.I. Netanyahu if you told you? Okay, of course, general destroy Hamas. Can it be destroyed? Can you say something about that? I would say to my military or civilian superiors that we can certainly go in and kill large numbers of people. But Hamas is more than 40 or 50 or 60,000 fighters. It's an idea. You want to kill the idea. You want to discredit it? You're going to have a lot of trouble relying exclusively on military power for that purpose. So you might want to consider looking at other things that could be done that would rob Hamas of its argument. Now, that's not easy. But if you plan to maintain the state of Israel in this region, that's something you have to think about. Historically, the Israelis were instrumental in helping Hamas come into existence because they were very good at manipulating various factions in the Islamic world against each other. And that worked to advantage any time there was a dispute anywhere or a conflict, the Israelis would involve itself with one or both sides. This is an entirely different set of circumstances, as we point out. Now, Hamas seems to be enjoying increasingly not just celebrity within a small area, but the support of the entire Islamic world, people from Indonesia to Morocco, are involved now. So, it's an idea. Killing ideas is very difficult. Killing people is easy, and you're never going to kill everyone, which means you're going to breed more opponents down the line. Unless you can line everyone up, all 2.2 million, and gun them down, you're going to get new generations of fighters. That's the problem. So the Israelis have to have a two, a two-pronged approach. So to say on the one hand, yes, we're going to go in, we're going to inflict damage, we're going to try and undermine it. You talked about tunnels. We use flamethrowers, particularly in the Pacific. I would expect the Israelis to use some fuel, air explosive, which is a AA, a vapor that ignites and then explodes, robs everything of oxygen, destroys everything. I would expect that to happen in some of these tunnels, that they can make it work. In other words, this is a no-holds-bar operation. But if you think that will be the end of it, you're making a mistake. And that's why I would warn the civilian authorities. What have you got in your back pocket, in terms of a strategy to deal with the profoundly human dimension of this? What are you going to do? And that would, I think, cause any thoughtful purpose person to back away from wholesale extermination. 
I mean, this is utter uh, amazing what you are describing my impression is if I look at the other pictures now of the warfare of Israel. If I talk to our correspondent in Tel Aviv, who are I would say he basically supports other, the, the Israel answer. But he says these are very disturbing images we see from Gaza. So if I understand you correctly, what is Israel doing right now is not actually destroying Hamas, but it is even um making this monster bigger. And it like if if puts not, I mean, other people will support Hamas because they see me because they see what, what Israel is doing is. Is Israel at the moment I'm acting against its own interest with this kind of warfare? I think so. And I think there are many Israelis who understand this, but they have no voice in the government, and I doubt seriously that their views are being heard by anyone in power. You're listening to the Netanyahu wing of Israeli politics that is out for blood and feel strongly that it has to administer this object lesson, or Israel won't survive as opposed to what I am suggesting, which is, if you administer the object lesson, Israel will not survive. That's my argument. And so I've said to people that would listen here in Washington, every president at some point has intervened in these conflicts involving Israel. He's operated usually as a check on Israeli power. In other words, the Israelis crossed the Suez Canal. We said no after the counterattacks to break through the Egyptian lines. He said, no, we don't want that pulled back to the other side of the Suez. Then we got a ceasefire. And as a result, we got an agreement, which was a very good agreement in the long run between Egypt and Israel. Right now, there is no check on Israeli power. There is no check on power from the United States being employed and Israel's behalf. I think a president today is really obligated to save Israel from itself. If Israel is to survive, my great fear is that that won't happen. The entire region will line up against it and nothing we do is going to save Israel. At that point, you mentioned before the First World War. This is highly interesting, the long road to the First World War. But I would say there was an, an interesting nuance or a difference that if you look at the, the politics in the beginning of the 20th century, my impression from what I've read and many of the superpowers of the day thought that they will actually prevail in this war, and they can get something out of it. Everybody had some kind of interest in going into war and completely misjudging the situation. They thought at the end of it, we will win. Surely the Germans thought they will win, the British thought they will win. The French thought together with the Russians, they will win. And isn't it? So today that nobody wants a global war, nobody wants to risk a global war, and be it Russia, be it China, be it the United States, even though they seem to have a severe leadership problem in Washington at the moment. So, isn't this a common interest of the superpowers of today? An argument which says we shouldn't panic at the moment? The scenario of a World War III in the Middle East starting there is not so big. What do you say? Or are you concerned that a third world war could emerge from this situation? Well, I haven't used World War III as a term. You know, I just, I just haven't because I think that if we are exposed to even a fraction of what you're describing, uh, people will be shocked and, and will reel back in fear of it. Now. The good news is that at least in Moscow, with President Putin, and certainly with President Xi in China, you're talking about two men who have been in political power for at least 20 years. That's a very important point. They're, they're experienced. They also represent countries with long memories and long histories of conflict. That makes a difference. It's helpful because I can tell you that if anything, everything that both of those men have done since this tragedy in Ukraine began has been to deliberately limit the fight we have provoked the Russians repeatedly, and the Russians have steadily refused to take the bait. I'll be frank with you. I'm not worried about Moscow and Beijing. I'm worried about Washington, and here's why we suffer from a terminal case of overweening arrogance. I think people used to talk about the, uh, Dutch, Uber, HLI type. You know, this is before World War I as a complaint. Uh, well, that was modest compared with what goes on in Washington. And you hear these people talk about the United States today as though it were 1,991, and it isn't. We're not the same country. Our economy is fragile. Our financial system is in, in my judgment, ruins poised for all sorts of crises. Then the population itself, we're dealing with the influx of millions of people that are not us. 
you know, you have that in, in Europe. We have it here. We're trying to sort through this. So we're not a cohesive society or nation as we once were. And in the midst of all of this, everyone seems to think that we are so powerful and so dominant that no one would dare contradict us and that anything we want to undertake will work that our weapons, our capabilities are superior. You, you don't have any reasonable debate in public about the dangers involved. We have completely forgotten war. The last time we had a war that affected Americans was World War II. And remember the last time we had a really major war that killed a million of us was the Civil War. So you have a different mentality here. It's a combination of arrogance, and I would also say ignorance. There's no understanding of, of the Middle East, just as there's no understanding of Eastern Europe. You know, I, I've said several times, what are we doing in Ukraine? We don't know anything about Ukraine. We don't know anything about Russia now. Sir, certainly some of us do, but the broader population doesn't. And again, they look at what's happening in Israel and say, well, it's these Arabs. Again, we just have to help them defeat these people, but it's not that simple. It's a much larger problem. And by the way, there's this perception that everyone there, including Iran and Turkey, are backward. There's no appreciation for the professional competence of the Turkish armed forces, or for that matter, in, in the Iranian armed forces, these people are in fact sophisticated. They have advanced air and space capabilities, advanced missile technology, and particularly the SO, the soldiers that serve. In the Turkish army, they're ferocious fighters. There's no, there's no sense of that. So I, I think that's the problem, arrogance and ignorance in Washington. And then the feeling that this is Israel's moment to deal decisively with its opponents to administer this important object lesson. Remember that throughout its history, the Israelis have always felt that if a single Jew in, in, in Israel is harmed, you must immediately strike back and crush the source, or Jews will never be safe. Well, 